Welcome, everyone. This is the Breakthrough Innovation Session. My name is Kelly Clark, and in the kind words of Mr. Elkington, I too am a mutant. I wear more than one hat. The first is I'm the director of the Telus Mater Foundation, which is one of the sponsors. It's a private family foundation dedicated to catalytic environmental philanthropy. I also am the MD and founder of Marmony Consulting, which is an impact investment and advisory firm. I've been very fortunate over the last six months to get to do a strategic review both for the foundation and for two major financial institutions operating in the UK. We met for the foundation over 100 people operating in the space, and we had the opportunity to ask big questions. One of the big answers we were looking for is what is the problem and how are we going to solve it? Similar question for the banks. What is the current landscape? What is the problem and where in that lies the opportunity? As Dimitri said, the golden opportunity. So the current landscape. We've heard many, many uh, examples today of what is in the news. Uh, sort of for fun, at about 4 o'clock this morning when I was thinking about this, I decided to do a quick Google shot of the news. This is what came up. It will sound very familiar. Major economies all over Europe are on the brink of imploding. Political instability continues to rock the Middle East and the Arab world. Unprecedented violence, unprecedented community protest. The shareholder spring. Is that a new term for anybody else? It adds a few other springs we've already heard today. The shareholder spring is shareholder activism in mass and in response to extreme executive pay. Now, I'm going to name examples throughout my brief presentation. It is not to name and shame, but rather to show the endemic nature of the problems that we're facing. So the shareholder spring, recently we saw Barclays, we saw Aviva, and we saw the bookmaker William Hill in the news, amongst many others. The US presidential race. Who ever expected the US presidential race to be calling private equity into question? The most powerful man in the world, some would argue, or at least one of, is actually calling the role of private equity into question. That's unprecedented. JP Morgan's recent $2 billion trading loss is further evidence that big banks lack the regulatory framework and internal discipline to effectively manage their risk. JP is not alone. We've seen it with Goldman, we've seen it with UBS, we've seen it with SockGen. This is an endemic problem. But why now? And why is this moment in time different. We've heard about historical narrative. We've heard about barriers. We've also heard about engaged communities. I was looking at 405 this morning at institutional investor. What does that mean? In these times, that means the ordinary citizen, the shareholder, the employee, and the activated individual. That means you and me. The article I was reading institutional investor has begun to act like quantum particles, i.e. differently when observed. We're on notice. We are observing. The world is changing. Media is playing a very different role. It has collapsed the distance between action and reaction. There's no more time arbitrage. Traditional and social media has broken down an important barrier. There is no longer any doubt about how interrelated we are and how quickly news can travel. We see this in demographics, and we see this in terms of joy, catastrophe, opportunity, and change. So that's the landscape. What's the problem? The problem is that the current system is broken. However, I think it's really important in saying that, I am not saying that capitalism can't work. I'm saying the current system is broken and we need new models. We need breakthrough capitalism in order to fix that system. So, a couple of examples. What exactly is broken? Well, top-down approaches to me don't work. The government, whether it be a national, a local, or a supranational entity, can't or won't act to fix the system. Financial markets don't currently value environmental externalities. Consumers, hopefully not us, maybe some of us, 
continue to operate in a business as usual way when it comes to consumption. Change as usual is very incremental on a consumer level, or has been. But as we know, out of breakdown arises opportunity. So what are we seeing now, and how are we going to take this system, this system breakdown and turn it to our advantage to create that golden opportunity? Well, we are all an example of the emergence of catalytic thought leadership. We are seeing new business models emerging at a startup level all the way through to the multinational level. And systemic solutions are bubbling up as a result of cross-sector dialogue and the breaking down of silos. So that's the opportunity. What does it take for this opportunity to take flight, for these opportunities to embed themselves? Well, we know that voices matter at every age and at every stage. It takes two important things. It takes the right people. The right people are us. We are passionate, engaged, and willing leaders. And it takes the right methods. In my opinion, the right methods are coalitions, collaborations, and platforms in which cross-sectoral debate can happen, information can be exchanged, and action can be taken. This is called living by our values. This has been represented by the previous speakers. It is the joining up of the right people with the right methods. What's the secret ingredient? You know, everyone's got one. McDonald's, you know the old slogan. I think in this case, it's called magic. We need to enable magic. What does magic mean in this context? Well, I was in a meeting yesterday, and the person that I was speaking to referred to collaborative action as the magic. They said, and this is a direct quote, sometimes something happens when a whole idea, a paradigm, or a solution shifts. It goes from the theoretical to the possible. The small to the big, the individual to the collective. When this happens, it is as if by magic perceptions change. No one's hands have moved, but the feeling in the room has shifted. This happens when we're convening, when we're facilitating dialogue, and when sharing creates opportunities. This is magic. So how do we embed magic, or in the terms of today's session, harness innovation? Well, we have the debate. We capture the debate. We encourage the conversation and we respond to a call to action. And in the response, we commit today, tomorrow, incrementally, and for the long term. And if we go way beyond incremental and we break the sound barrier, that's brilliant. And we look at the long term. In my opinion, dialogue and debate must happen at every level because it breaks down these barriers. It promotes understanding and it creates unexpected alignments. In alignments comes innovation. It's where new systems come together, new people meet, new models form, and capital is deployed in a different way. Redundancy of effort is no longer good enough. Redundancy or duplication of capital flows is not gonna get us to where we need to go. It is time for leadership and collaboration to merge, to create coalitions. One of the commitments that we came to at the foundation after our strategic review is that everything we do is through collaboration. And we do our absolute best to understand the map so that we don't contribute to the problem of redundancy of efforts. We don't have time to behave that way. Innovation happens across the piece as well as down the verticals. I was so interested to see how this has been put on the board by other speakers. This is ecosystems. These are living organisms, not machines, as David Orrell said. This is spherical, unified, and whole. And our challenge is to balance the tensions between grassroots disruption and scale. So before I bring my speakers up, I'd like to leave you with a thought and a question. And I want each of you to understand that I'm speaking to you individually, each and every one of you, and I'm speaking to us collectively, because that's what it's gonna take. Each of us and collective. First, the thought. The small incremental decisions 
that we take while we are busy thinking about the big questions are the ones that shape the dialogue and thus the future. Be aware. As Pamela said, we need books, time, and silence because we are making decisions that form our future. And now the question. What does it, cre what does it take to create systemic change? Well, clearly it starts with us. And each and every one of us is going to have our own views on that. Mine is this is what it takes. It takes intention, the desire to do so. It takes aspiration, something that is bigger than me and maybe bigger than anything I could possibly do on my own. Of course, something bigger than I could do on my own. It takes inspiration, some form of passion that drives us no matter what. It takes collaboration. We are much bigger than the sum of the individual parts. It takes leadership, a willingness to stand up, to be counted, and to have the debate. It takes action, a movement, and a conviction. And most importantly, it takes reflection so that we can continuously improve. That is my view of what it takes to create systemic change. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker.